we have Harley Race here. Harley Race, one of the all-time greats of this profession, uh, from, uh, from started wrestling as uh, what 15, 16 years old, and is still involved in the business today. With uh, still involved with World League Wrestling, Harley. Yes, I am. Is this Dave? This is Dave. Dave and it's Brian Alvarez and uh, Dave Meltzer here with Harley Race. Hey, Dave, how are you? I'm doing really good. Are you the same Dave Meltzer from Mankato, Minnesota? No, no. I've never been in Mankato, Minnesota in my life. Ah, there was a guy <laughs> by the name of Dave Meltzer from, Ma I think it was Dave anyhow, Meltzer from Mankato, Minnesota. It was back, was around when I was in Minneapolis. Hmm. Which has been a lot of years ago. Yeah, that's the, that's the 60s, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, um, I saw... The TV special, in fact, I just rewatched it a couple of weeks ago that they did in St. Louis uh, some months back that you were a big part of, the, like the the history of uh, wrestling at the Chase. And there was a tape, and you talked about this. I guess you were very young in the business when, when, when you first wrestled at Wrestling at the Chase when it was at the Coruscant Room, and you were describing the atmosphere. And, I mean, it was like it was so unlike anything that I had ever seen in wrestling, the, the tape of, of wrestling at the Coruscant Room in St. Louis, early 60s. And I thought maybe you could, like, tell people about what was the difference, and even more so, uh, why. <laughs> I, it was just like, wow, I've just never seen anything like this in wrestling. Well, that was back before everybody started uh, talking about wrestling in the frame of mind that they talk about it today. And it was just... Uh, the right spot at the right place and time. It was great being able to be a part of it. And if wrestling was still held in the esteem that it was held back then, it would be a much better business today. Now, could you explain what you what you mean by by that? As far as um. Just the respect for wrestling as a craft is what you mean, or do you mean, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, people talk about wrestling more openly now, or, or a combination of both? Combination of both. Uh, the ability of a lot of the kids uh, nowadays is still there. Uh, it's really a sham that they use the word wrestling in front of a lot of it, but it's there. Well, it, it it evolved. <laughs> it, it just, I guess, it just evolved into what it is. Without where I know what you're saying that there was a lot more. Uh, I wasn't. Actual... It didn't evolve into what it is today. It was led that way purposely. You know, you're right about that, actually. Yeah. What are your feelings about uh, the good and the bad of wrestling in the year 2000? Well, the good part, everybody's making a lot of money. The bad part is that uh, once that bubble bursts, where are they going to go from there? Mm -hmm. What's uh, as far as uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna say things about the the current scene, what what uh, in particular don't you like about the current scene? As far as like maybe if you're afraid of the future of the industry or. Uh, just just pitfalls that maybe you're afraid they're going to walk into that they need to sidestep? Or maybe Are we live on into? the air right now? Yeah, we're live on the air, yeah. So I have to be a little bit careful about what I say, right? Uh, no, nah, I don't have to be that careful. <laughs> we're on the air. Unless you want to be. <laughs> All the fingers that you see stuck up in the air and the gestures made toward your crotch and... Things like that don't need to be in anything. It may be uh, funny, it may get a laugh or two, but how do you explain that to your child when you go home? Uh, the you know, at some point there has to be an end to, to what people will uh, do to entertain other people. Um, as far as, um, do you think that it's just like one of those things where the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the uh, the standards have just dropped to such a low degree that in the long run it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt the profession? Well, sure it is. Uh, look back to the 60s when they called everybody hippies that were doing virtually the same thing. 
uh, now a lot of those people are uh, are leading some of this, and and they I don't know if whether they want to admit that uh, they're re reliving their childhood or, or whatever, but uh, does it remind you a lot of the 60s? I wasn't around in the 60s, so I, mean, I, was, I was actually like, <laughs> Brian wasn't around in the 60s. I was alive in the 60s, but not old enough to, to really remember anything that happened then. You don't remember the peace signs and the free love and... I mean, I remember, I, I vaguely remember that from from uh, from that period, and I remember uh, Billy Graham, who was actually the one of the first wrestlers I ever saw on television, uh, used to do kind of a kind of like a gimmick based on that before he became superstar Billy Graham. Uh, you know, where he would be colorful and do the peace sign and things like that. I mean, actually, my earliest memories of wrestling probably are more in tune to that than actually living through that period. Well. If you're, I don't even know how the hell to, have to uh, relate to what what we're talking about there, other than the fact that that's the closest thing that I can relate it to. And if it continues to go that way, it's, it's going to bubble and bubble, and that la or the elasticity of that bubble is pretty soon going to stretch too far. Do you see any guys nowadays that remind you like a good classical wrestler? I didn't hear that. Um, do you see any of the wrestlers today that like uh, of the wrestlers today that remind you of a good classical, you know, wrestler? The type of um, I mean, are there I think there's some of the guys today and uh, that 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 would have fit in as far as like the top of the rung in the 70s. Uh, you know, like the real heavily, very very skilled at, at the art of working matches, uh, as opposed to. Cheap heat, I guess, if, that, is, if that's what we're going to be comparing it to. I'm not even sure if that's the right term. But, I mean, I guess he's trying that's, to say That's a real good term. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of guys out there that that can still wrestle. Uh, to sit here and to name them all off to you, it would take me quite a while because there's that many of them that can still do it. It's just that they're, you know, they're not allowed to do it uh, for time restraint. Uh Someone couldn't go out there like uh, they did the other night with uh, WWF and, and talk for 34 minutes before the first thing started. Uh, if, and I'm not saying that all of that's bad. We did we did promos back in my year also, but they weren't 34 minutes in the wrestling 16. It was a lot more the other way around. Before we get to the calls, I just wanted to ask uh, Harley. You know, you have wrestled pretty well everywhere in the world at some point during your career, and I just want to know if you had to name your favorite places to wrestle, favorite promoters, least favorite promoters. What what pops in your mind when questions like that are asked? Well, my favorite, uh, of course, is Japan. I've been I was in and out of Japan 65 different times. Uh, over that same length of time that you're just talking about. Uh, the prettiest country, in my opinion, is New Zealand. Uh, promoters are pretty much the same uh, worldwide. Now, I've been one myself, uh, and right now I'm one as we speak. Uh, when you were in Japan, um, I know that you wrestled many, many, many matches with Jumbo Saruta, who passed away last or two weeks ago now. And I was actually wanting to ask you what what your thoughts, because Jumbo Saruta, I mean, to me was just an awesome worker, awesome wrestler. Yeah, Jumbo came uh, to Amarillo, Texas, right after the '72 Olympics, and broke in in Amarillo. Uh, I was in and out of there a lot at that time. And overall, Jumbo was as, as nice a guy as you'd ever want to meet. Uh, and he was that way 24 hours a day, uh, not just in public. Uh, 
Um, we have an email here from someone asking me a question. I'm not actually familiar with this, but maybe you are. Was there an incident with you and, and Jackie Gleason, like an angle or something like that? They said that, like, what was the story between Harley Race and Jackie Gleason? And I'm, I'm just not familiar with that. Was there anything? Back in the early 70s when they came out with Smokey and the Bandit, uh, Gleason was, of course, a part of that. And he'd been out of uh, the limelight for quite some time when he had finally closed down the, the Jackie Gleason hour. So he wanted to do something in front of the, in front of the public again that would kind of uh, spear in, into Smokey and the Bandit. So it was kind of uh, set up that night when I walked out to the ring rest, wrestling the Rock's father that he was to shake hands with, with Rocky Johnson, come over uh, to me, and I'd extend my hand, and he'd do that, and away you go stuff, just slap my hand and do his walk out of the ring. Well, during the course of the evening, he had a little bit too much to drink, and he thought, well, if I just cheap shot him, I can knock him out. So that's what he tried to do. And then later on, uh, in the Milwaukee paper, it came out, the UPS, or whatever the initials are for the United Press Association, he told the story exactly the way it happened, and that was it. And also... Uh what uh let's see what was oh, we've got a question here um this is this is from uh johnny tibbs uh i knew the way this was going to come up um could you please ask carly to explain his position the show must go on regarding owen hart's death at the kansas city pay-per-view he goes i heard his comments on the law show and i couldn't disagree more and he used injuries in the nfl as an example of the show going on without interruption and his thought is, he goes, if Brett Favre or Steve Young had a violent collision on the field and died at that moment, I'm sure the game would have been stopped. If not, could you imagine the headlines? The pay-per-view should have been stopped out of respect for Owen's family, if nothing else. Besides, it's the only thing to do under the circumstances because the man died. Um, and anyway, I was wondering, you know, I know you were, and I know that you, you were friends with Owen Hart, and uh, you made those comments, and I uh, was just wondering, you know, what your thoughts are of all that. I've been friends with the Hart family dating back to the early 70s. And what I said, in effect, was that Detroit Lions were playing the Kansas City Chiefs in Kansas City. One of the players was paralyzed, and he's never walked since. And the game continued. Uh, Al Unser's kid was just killed the other day on the speedway, and the race continued. It's part of the entertainment business. We're out there to do the show. And as tragic as that horrible thing was, had they stopped it right then, there would have been 19,000 plus people demanding their money back and probably a lot more injuries than the tragic one that had just happened. Um, I, I, I mean, to me, I, I, I have to say that I would disagree on that only because they have rainouts in baseball routinely, and it's not really an issue. And I've seen concerts stopped, you know, when when a performer has you know a, a bad throat. And I've just seen like a lot of inter. I mean, I, I, I he, the, 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 con the concert that you saw stop because the singer had the bad throat. Was that right in the middle of it? Uh, I was right at the. It was uh, very early on. Yeah. Well, did they have did they have any problem with the public? Um, not what I would call. I mean, you know, they had disgruntlement, but as far as like, you know, it wasn't like it was a dangerous situation or anything like that. Well, I've been involved in events where people died. Ted DiBiase's father died in my arms in Lubbock, Texas. And the ambulance was backed in and they hauled him out. And the match continued. Did this I, continue? It happened several different times. Owen Hart was not the first. And it continued. Yeah. Not too long ago, there was a boxer who died in the ring. They didn't stop the boxing card. 
Uh, they they had a, they had a show in Kansas City where they did stop the boxing card, and the guy. Um, in fact, it was right very shortly after Owen Hart died. Oh yeah, um, shortly was, after. Yeah, right, yeah, they did stop. They did stop the. I remember there was a boxing show in Kansas City where a guy took a terrible beating, and he actually didn't die for about three days afterwards. But he he did die. But they stopped the show uh, at, at that point because of the fear that he might die. And also because it was, it was like just a couple of months after Owen died, and it was it was at a casino in Kansas City, and just the 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 idea that because it was Kansas City, I think that the promoters felt, and not only that, but they actually canceled their next show uh, because I, I forget what the whole story was, but they had announced a, a follow up show and canceled the next show out of respect to the boxer. Well, that that may be all, all well and true, but again. You, you just said it was after the Owen Hart thing. It was in Kansas City. And if you believe that that didn't have a lot to do with what they did. Oh, it had everything to do with it. They, they all said that. They all said because of uh, the negativity towards what happened in Kansas City that the boxing promoters just felt that, you know, they, they didn't want to repeat the mistake the WWF made. Was, was basically It wasn't their reasoning that they said publicly, but everyone knew that that was, that was part of their reasoning. Yeah, but, you know, like I said, Owen, Owen was not the first one to die in the ring. And, and God help us, this hope is that he is the last, but in all probability he won't be. Uh, that's just the sad reality of it. Uh, we go in there with, with injury in mind. You know, you can be hurt at any given moment. Uh, Take the, the football player that got hurt up there and was paralyzed for quite a while. That's just part part of it. Uh, they didn't stop that one. Uh, I really don't know of any that has ever stopped when a wrestler was really seriously injured or when when one died. Um, I, I mean, I know, I know that uh, when Larry Cameron died in, in um, I think it was Austria, uh, that they did stop. I mean, I, I know, that, I know that example. I mean, there may may be others, but you know, I'm aware of when Larry Cameron had a heart attack and they stopped the show. Well, I wasn't aware of that one, but yeah, that's in the, the mid '90s. I guess you know, it's, it's would be the call of whoever would, whoever would happen to be there running it at the time. Had I had been there running it at the time. I would have done just what uh, they did. I would have went on with the show. Now, if you were running, what, what are your thoughts as far as some of the, and I don't want to belabor the Owen Hart point, uh, the, you know, the weird coincidence, of course, you being actually one of the final, I think you were one of the final people who actually talked with him. And I know that, you know, um, what, what are your, as far as the, um, the, you know, the type of stunts and stuff that that, that involved, I mean, do you, I, I, and it's not a lawsuit question either, but just do you think that that's gotten out of hand in wrestling as far as like, some of the, the risk-taking and things like that? Yes, I do. Uh, and I was one of the originators of a lot of that goofy stuff. At, at some point, uh, sliding, down, sliding down a cable like that to me has nothing to do with it. Uh, he wasn't the first to do that either. Hell, back in uh, the 50s, they had a guy who used to swing down on, on a rope until he hit the top rope and tripped himself and damn near killed himself. So, you know, all that stuff's been done before, but I don't think there's uh, any any part of it that has anything to do with wrestling. And I didn't I didn't like it then, I don't like it now. Let's take the phone. And stuff? Oh, okay, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. What about the, uh, there's a lot more stunt work in wrestling nowadays. Do you uh, think that that's um, going to lead to more injuries, or what are your feelings on that? Well, uh, as far as the stunts are concerned, if there's a semblance of, of being in, involved in a, in a wrestling thing, you know, like I said, they've been there uh, forever, and they're not going to go away, so... It's just at at some point you have to say I've stretched this thing as far as I can stretch it. Now, 
you know, you were one of the first guys to do a lot of uh, the top rope moves, uh, diving headbutt off the top rope. Um, I don't know if you were the first, but you're probably the first one I ever saw. You know, Dynamite Kid later did it, and Benoit does it a lot. And a lot of guys do it today. Um, as far as like what physical price, I mean, you were you were for your for your era, you were a huge risk taker. And, and did it night after night for a long, long time, uh, but not from the heights that some of these guys are doing it now. I mean, do you think, like, with your experience looking back, what type of physical, uh, what's the word, price are these guys going to pay when they get to be, say, 40, 50, 55 years old? Well, February 2nd this year, I just had five vertebrae fused in my back. The three, four, and five lumbar, and the top two sacroiliac. Uh, at some point, I'm going to have to have my neck fi fixed, like Austin just had his. That's what I originally went in into uh, the doctor for was the neck. So that's the price I paid for abusing my body for 40 years. I want to start going to the phones. Let's go start with Wes in Virginia. Wes, you're first up with Harley Race. Hey, guys. How's it going? Very uh, good. I wanted to ask Harley uh, what the relationship was with Ole Anderson, and uh, I know there was some, some heat between the two. If he would comment on that. I can hardly hear him. Can... He, he was asking about uh, Ole Anderson. I mean, there was a period. In fact, I'm kind of curious about this myself. There was a period in the early 80s when you were world champion where for a long period of time you never went into Atlanta uh, when Atlanta had the national outlet, and they never mentioned your name even though you were. It, it, was there any reason for you know that, or is it just what, what's the story behind that? That was an inner squabble between uh, the people that were trying to take over the National Wrestling Alliance uh, versus the powers that were to be at that point in time. Uh, it wasn't really Atlanta that I didn't go into. Uh, it was actually the Carolinas, and the Carolinas had uh, virtually control of Atlanta TV at that point. So was it more of a Crockett thing than only Anderson thing, or was it a combination of both? Or... Uh, Crockett. Really? And 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 so what was uh? Do you know what like uh, what that what that was all about? Were they were just trying to take over the the alliance at that point in time, or? Well, it's kind of it's really kind of hilarious. Uh, back about that point was when the move was move was to consolidate uh, the whole National Wrestling Alliance around the Carolinas rather than in St. Louis, where it had been for 50 years, and. It was just a just a power struggle, uh, trying to head uh, New York off, and it all come up short. What um, I was going to say, this is this is uh, 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 Wes. Is there anything else you wanted to ask? Yeah, uh, one quick. I uh, wanted to ask them how the thing with the secrets of pro wrestling on NBC, like about a year ago, turned out. And I know there was some backlash from some people from that. I just wondered his comments. Yeah, that's right. That that secrets of I mean, were did you know what it was going to be going in, and what were your feelings on no, coming I out? No, I did not know what it was going to be going in, or I wouldn't have went out there to start with. Once I had already got there, uh, if you noticed, I was the only person on there. Period that did not have a mask or have their face or something covered up one way or the other. I thought. If I'm stupid enough to let myself get back into this, then I'm going to be man enough to face it coming out. So when you, what, what, how did they pitch that thing to you, and and what were your feelings on the show when after it aired? Well, after it aired, uh, if you saw the same same one I saw, I was only on there a brief, uh, just a real brief part on two different little flicks and what they'd actually taped was ours but I didn't tell them what they wanted to hear so I got the two little clips that were on there what did they want to hear 
Well, if I tell you, I'd be myself well bit uh, set it to there where I was getting paid for it, right? <laughs> yeah. but it was, they basically no. Now what, what they wanted to hear, because you know, to me, a lot of that show, there were there were things that were said, you know, like uh, I'm sure she's a stunt grannies and things like that, which were, you know, kind of to me killed whatever truth there was in there. There was so much that wasn't true that when it was over, my reaction was, you know, it's like, you know, whoever was the technical advisor to this was was making a lot of stuff up or didn't know anything about wrestling. Yeah, um, they were. <laughs> And, and I mean, with, with the stuff that you were telling them, were you just trying to tell them, look, you know, some of the stuff that you're purporting to be the secrets of wrestling is not actually part of wrestling? Uh, on numerous occasions I said that to them. But that was, you know, again, they're, they're cutting the film, not me. Uh, there was so much stuff on there that there's just absolutely n has nothing to do with wrestling that they made. You know, they made the thing ridiculous for themselves. Yeah, because when the, the thing was over, I mean, it was pretty much lambasted for it's just, aside from it being just a really bad show, the credibility to, to, to like, anyone who was a wrestling fan who just, you know, talks about some of the things, you know, and I guess the stunt grannies just pops in my mind. Um, when they were talking about this happens every night in wrestling, and I'm thinking, geez, you know, I've been going to wrestling since I was, you know, for 30 years, and I, I'm still looking for the granny and the knee pads taking bumps. <laughs> yep, there. Uh, like I said, there was uh, tons of film shot there, and they had uh, their choice of what they wanted to air of it, and they wound up making a fool of, them, of themselves with it. Uh, I wound up making a fool of myself to even go out, uh, to appear out there to start with, but again, I had uh, I like to say I had enough guts to to uh, confront the thing, uh, and at least they they knew who I was. Well, how how was it going from uh, territory to territory? Because you know now the, the the champions they wrestle within one promotion. They wrestle the same guys every night. When you were champion in the 70s and then the 80s as well. He basically wrestled every top guy within the NWA, you know, in 20-plus territories, year-round, uh, pretty grueling schedule. Well, I'll give you two for instances on that. Excuse me. I wrestled one hour to a draw in Tokyo, Japan on Friday night. I left there and wrestled Jack Briscoe in St. Louis, Missouri, on Friday night, with the time change coming back and the date change, one hour. Left Kansas, or, uh, St. Louis the following morning and wrestled Carlos Colon for an hour in San Juan, Puerto Rico. That, my friend, is asking a, a world of any one human being. Oh, my God. Just they talked about that hour that they did on the uh, show, uh, Vince's show the other night, like it had never been done before. <laughs> then I had a tour to Australia. I wrestled five straight hours and two 90 minuters in one week. I left Australia look like the human sponge or the human. Uh, Prune, you know, you were just every, everything about you was crinkly, where you'd dehydrated. But if I had it all to do over again, I wouldn't change a whole lot of it. Was uh, wrestling at WrestleMania three? This is from Andrew Thomas. Was wrestling in WrestleMania three a, a career highlight at the that big crowd in, in uh, Pontiac? Uh, sure, it was great. Uh, when you walk out in front of. 20,000 plus people, whether it's 20 or 100, you really don't know uh, a heck of a lot of difference. Uh, that that thing was was probably at that point the, the largest one ever. They've had some bigger since, but the highlight of my career was the first and the last time I won the title. So now the first the first time was was that Kansas City from Dory Funk Jr. Yes. 
And then the last time would have been with Flair. Right. Is that is that St. Louis with Flair? No, Wellington, New Zealand. Oh, the restaurant that's the New Zealand one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any specific reason why the New Zealand one would be a career highlight? I just got two steps ahead of Fez at that point in time. <laughs> What do you think about the state of some of the titles nowadays that are changing hands every week? Well, when when you've only got two organizations and two bosses, they can change it whenever they want to. Uh, I don't really agree with it because at some point your title doesn't mean anything. How... You know, you you actually you held that title on and off for eleven years. What what is? I, mean, I guess this is probably not even. A, uh, what, how often do you think a title can be changed uh, to where it just becomes changed so often that it, that a, a title change means nothing, and then the title itself stops meaning a lot? Well, you're seeing it happen right now. Uh, the frequency. I guess would depend really on uh, who's there and who's prepared. Uh, but what? But when there's just two groups and they never wrestle one another, and it becomes kind of a inner sanctum thing. I guess just whoever they get uh, in the position to to keep the seats full. What uh, you wrestled Bob Backlund when he was WF champion, probably half a dozen times, maybe more. Um, not a lot. Um, was there any? What was the politics behind that? Ma those matches. I mean, was it just one of those things where the companies were working? You know, WF and uh, WWF and uh, NWA were working close enough together where they could just put the match on to dr to, to help draw a crowd in some places, or were there was 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 there more po politics behind it than just the fact that they were couple of cities maybe wanted that match well back at that point in time the WWF couldn't use the world the word world they call it the WWF champion they couldn't use the word world in it because they were actually a member of the National Wrestling Alliance at that time um, I wrestled back when I think three different times for the title. Uh, once in Florida, once in New York, and then once in St. Louis. Uh, New York City, he won on disqualification, but of course, under the uh, National Wrestling Alliance, Alliance rules at that point, title could not change on disqualification. Uh, As far as being a political thing, I, I don't think really then that that was involved in it because it's just, you know, the people had wanted that match for so long they decided to give it to them, and when they did, they decided to do it in two or three different places. Let's let's go to Chris in Indiana. Chris, you're next up with Harley Race. Hello, Dave. Um, hey, how hi, are you? Hi, Mr. Race. It's uh, great to talk to you. Um, I'll speak up, or Dave, I'll just talk to you if I need to. I know we got a bad connection sometimes. Um, uh, just talk loud and uh, it should be okay. You, okay. Harley, you can hear him fine? Yeah, I'm, I can hear him. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Race, I was just, I know you mentioned a couple minutes ago about uh, you're, you've had to have some vertebrae fused and that I was just going to ask, you know, how have you been feeling the last couple of years here? I know you had um, a, a botched surgery a few years ago and I just wanted to know how you're getting around these days and how you're feeling. Well, I just came back from the doctor in Kansas City yesterday, and he told me the fusion had taken great and everything looked good, and I automatically felt about three times better right then. I'd been kind of uh, concerned about it, but a lot of that stuff becomes mental. Uh, all through my abdominal surgeries and stuff like that, I never, I never really thought that that was going to be the end of my career, and it wasn't. Probably should have been, and I'd have felt better to, uh, than I do right now. But wasn't it a car I, accident? I still get around halfway decent. 
Wasn't it a car accident that knocked you out of WCW there in 90, what was that, 94, 93? Now, what was the injury that ended your career with WCW as far as, because um, you were managing Vader, if I remember? Uh, yes. I was managing Vader, and I had an automobile accident and wound up with a plastic hip after three surgeries. Yeah. Wow. Um, I know that um, the Dynamite Kid has, has spoken highly of you as one of uh, one of the guys that he he puts you you know right up there. He he said you were probably his best friend in wrestling in his book, and uh, even on the on his website he does the Q and A question and answer with the fans, and he's always spoken highly of you. I just wanted to know maybe what are a few of your memories of, of uh, Dynamite, some of your time together. Dynamite uh, when he first came to Canada from England uh, was a. A real tough, tough little guy, and then he got into weightlifting and a few of the other things. Uh, overall, Danamite was just a great, great guy. I thought of Danamite as a son more than I did as a, another wrestler. Yeah, he said that even though the two of you were, uh, there was an age gap there. The two of you were like, uh, were uh, like peas in the pod, basically. So well, did you you met him first in Canada, right? With the, for for Calgary. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, my last... Whenever I go to Calgary, I'd stay with him and his wife at that at that point in time. Uh, if it, he was probably the most uh, worthless guy in the world when it come to uh, repairing things around the house. So whenever I <laughs> arrived there, I'd get a list of things that need to be fixed. <laughs> Well, Dynamite and I have one thing in common, at least. That's good. <laughs> um, and just one, one last thing. This is something that we, we talk about almost uh, we. Uh, it gets talked about almost every every guest and every wrestler that uh, Dave has on the show. But will the boys ever be able to stick together long enough and um, without the backstabbing to form any kind of a union to uh, to uh, team up against promoters? Do you ever see that happening? No. No. <laughs> Succinct answer. Yep. <laughs> it's kind of like this is the answer we come up with, too. That's easy, yeah. Well, Mr. Wraith, um, I wish that there were more tapes of the early 70s around because, I, you know, I've, I've loved watching your matches with Briscoe. And uh, I can still, yeah, the, I thought Rock and Humbly had a good match. And uh, there is a lot of, of uh, nobody thought of doing it in this day and age. But I know that uh, you and the boys used to do it four or five nights a week. So that's really something that's a lost art because there's just not an attention span for it. But. I just want to thank you for a great career, and I hope you have a, a peaceful retirement. Well, thank you. It's greatly all the compliments are greatly appreciated. Rock, well, that's you know what I was saying earlier. There's a lot of guys out that are capable are still doing this, and it's just a shame that uh, they can't uh, put more of that in into what they're doing now. But. You can't, I guess you really can't knock success. You know, if you're selling out every night, you're doing something right. May not be everything that everybody agrees to, but they're doing something right. Now, what if you're not selling hardly any tickets at all? Are you doing anything right? <laughs> <laughs> Evidently not. <laughs> um, there's a email here who says, uh, can you name some wrestlers uh, who for whatever reason that you probably came across during your career who you felt, you know, had the ability that just didn't get the right break, didn't get the right chance, that, that could have been, you know, top, top guys, and conversely, wrestlers who got breaks that became big stars that you felt were maybe lucky and maybe didn't deserve those breaks? Uh, one that kind of uh, sticks out right off the bat back in my so-called ear uh was a guy by the name of Tex McKenzie. Tex McKenzie didn't know up and down, left or right, but he made quite a bit of money. Uh, there, there's been a few over the years that, uh, for want of a better expression, had not paid their dues for, for what they got out of it. And then there's been some that has spent their whole entire career paying their dues and has made nothing. Any any examples of someone who like maybe especially when you went from territory to territory there was a guy maybe you wrestled him like in a TV match and not a, not a main event on a big show and all of a sudden and you just went wait a minute you know this guy's this you know why is this guy why is this guy in this position uh, you know what I mean when when he's this is, is there any like names that would pop in when I describe something like that well uh, now some of those guys 
uh, went on went on to to do quite a bit. Uh, take Paul Orndorff. I I talked Paul Orndorff into uh, getting out of a uh, situation that he was in in Oklahoma and coming first to Kansas City, then going to the Carolinas, then he wound up in New York and and become a, a superstar. Then he went into Atlanta, and he's still uh, working with the power plant there in Atlanta. There's a lot of those guys that uh, that were around, and I tried to funnel quite a few up to Kansas City. Of course, I had a vested interest in doing that. Yeah. But you know, there was there were several guys around back then uh, that could have been a lot lot better than than where they were. And wasn't yep. for lack of talent. Uh, we've got Will in Sacramento. Will, you're next up. Hello. Hey, how are you? Bye. Nice to talk to you. Enjoy your show. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say hi to Harley Race. He's my all-time favorite wrestler. Oh, and thank I you. met him in the airport in uh, Memphis a few years ago, and he was very cordial to me, and I appreciate it. I wanted to ask uh, Harley if he still has any involvement in amateur wrestling. I know at the time uh, he was an assistant coach at a high school or something. Wasn't your son like a really good am? I, I met your son once, Harley, about, God, I'm thinking it's got to be about eight or ten years ago, and he was like a really, wasn't he, did you have a son who was a really good amateur wrestler? Well, he was two times uh, Kansas State uh, amateur, once in the kids program and then once in, in uh, the high school program. Uh, and I did do a lot of coaching uh Back during that point of time, uh, I took him when he was a, a little kid, and then through his high school year or years. And now that I'm here in, in Eldon, Missouri, doing what I'm doing now, I had uh, an amateur class for the kids here in Eldon uh, that was all last fall, and probably start again this fall. Hello, you guys still there? I'm here, I'm here. I'm okay, here. Anything here. else, Will? Sorry. Will, yeah, anything else? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, I, I was also going to comment about Reed Flair and this amateur status thing. Yeah. Uh, I run an amateur wrestling club here in Northern California. I have kids from third grade up to seniors in high school. And as far as his appearance on a pro wrestling show, I don't think that would affect him in, in any way. Uh, they, I don't think for him it would be any different than him being in, like, a school play or something. Because, you know, in the world of amateur wrestling or Olympic style, they don't really have a, you know, where a situation where they get paid to do anything unless they're doing clinic. And I don't really think that would affect him very much. As a matter of fact, I thought that his two leg shots were the best wrestling on the show last night, but that's just my opinion. There, uh, there was a... Like there was a period where, um, you know, if, if you were like a collegiate wrestler and you did a pro match, you'd lose your eligibility. Is that not, right? not that many, yes. not that many years ago. I mean, you know, I mean, even or even, I would think that was up to about ninety. Whenever it was when Dan Severn turned pro, so I'm thinking it's like ninety two, ninety three, because Dan Severn turned pro because he could still compete amateur, and he and he put off turning pro until that ruling was changed. Well, I remember that Schultz and those guys were trying to start actually like a, a professional wrestling tour. Uh, doing freestyle wrestling and it, the show, like Mark and Dave. Yes. Yeah. And it didn't uh, never you know never put any butts in the seat. That's the bottom line, uh, which is a shame, but that's the way it is. Uh, I also yeah. wanted to ask Carly Race, um, who was his favorite guy to work with, and who was his least favorite guy to work with. Well, again, that that kind of uh, too far. Uh, Two-fold question. Uh, the favorites would have been uh, a f either one of the funks, more of a Dory, because he did a lot more wrestling than Terry did, or a Jack Briscoe, who was just a pure uh, great wrestler. Uh, the least would be uh, the big fat guys that couldn't move when he got in the ring with them. <laughs> Well, I sure appreciate you uh, answering my question, and uh, I wish you a happy retirement. Well, thank you. And uh, Dave, uh, how about some lucha news once in a while, too? I, I try. It's hard to keep up with that. It's hard to keep up with so much stuff. Well, since they moved to Tuesday nights, I'm finally able to really sit down and watch the shows again. And I, I love lucha. You know, I, I so, wrestled. So do I. 
What? So so do, so do I. It's I mean, great uh, stuff. I wrestled I mean, amateur for 13 years, and I still coach amateur wrestling, but uh, I went to my first live pro wrestling show in 1969, so I'm an old mark. Yeah. And, was, it in uh, Sac was it in Sacramento or was it somewhere else? No, I uh, I wrestled in the Los Angeles area. Okay. And uh, I, uh, after that, I went to Long Beach Community College, Cal State Long Beach, wrestled there. And then after that, I played judo for a few years. And uh, But I'm still an old pro wrestling mark. I can't help myself. Okay. Sure, appreciate it. Okay, guys, now it's time for WF Daily Trivia brought to you by RC Edge. The first two people to respond correctly by email to Dave Meltzer at iata.com will win a poster of a WF Superstar, courtesy of RC Edge. And remember to include your mailing address with your answer. And also, if you've won anything from IATA in the last 60 days, you are not eligible to win this contest. Here's today's question. Which of these wrestlers never wrestled in Madison Square Garden during the 1970s? And this is the list. Ric Flair, Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk Jr., Terry Funk, Harley Race, Giant Baba, Jumbo Saruta, Antonio Inoki, Vern Gagne, and Billy Robinson, who were basically the cream of the crop of wrestling in the 70s. Uh, uh, hello? Yes. Okay. So anyway, uh, that was uh, that's our question. So you can email us in at DaveMeltzer at iata.com. We're here with Harley Race and, of course, with Brian Alvarez and your phone calls. And uh, let's go to Dave in Cincinnati. Dave, how are you doing today? I, Hello. I can't hear him at all. I can't hear him at all either. Uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is Dave here? Yeah. Okay, Dave, go ahead. I, I, we didn't hear you before. Uh, Harley, uh, what are your memories of uh, Ric Flair? Harley, can you hear him now? No, I can't. Okay, he was asking uh, what your thoughts are of uh, your memories of wrestling Ric Flair. Uh, wrestling Ric Flair? Yeah. Well, that, that could span a lot of things. Uh, Ric Flair, uh, during the late 70s into the 80s, was as good as there it was as good as there was uh you know he he could do about anything he never was a great amateur of course but uh a lot of people weren't but as far as uh charisma being able to move in the ring go as long as you ever want to go rick was right up there with all of them uh, did you enjoy getting i remember i think like vader in 1993 vader was injured and you actually Filled in for Vader and wrestled Flair on some like house shows. Yeah, towards the end of your career. Um, when, were you happy that you got the opportunity to? Were those matches any good? And were you happy that you got the opportunity to to work with them? I, I think I read that one of them was like a forty minute match. Uh, you're going to have to repeat what he said. Uh, okay, okay. He he said that when there was a period where Vader was injured, and um, you wrestled. This would be like towards the tail end of your career. They used you as a sub in a lot of matches with Flair, and he said that like. Uh, he seemed to recall that one of one one of the nights you did like a thirty or forty minute match. But uh, what, he's, what are your thoughts right. of, of of wrestling Flair? You know, like at that stage, I guess that would have been the last matches that you had with Flair. So, well, I knew that I was in good enough shape then to wrestle thirty minutes, and I told him if they changed the time limit from uh, sixty to thirty, I'd wrestle him any night they wanted me to. But I had enough uh, enough pride in in my own ability that I knew I could do 30 minutes and do it with ease, and that's what we did. Hey, anything else, Dave? Uh, yeah. Also, I remember Dave. You talked about um, a Brett the Hitman Hart Diesel match. Remember when uh, Brett hit the table? You said that was a big thing in the WWF. When when Brett did the did, I'm sorry. When Brett did the table bump. Yeah. Yeah, the, I remember like Harley did like a headbutt through a table against on a match against Paul Kogan on uh, Saturday Night's Main Event, and wasn't like Harley like seriously injured from that? I think that was like the first time I ever saw somebody go through a table. As, as I recall, now didn't wasn't it? Was, were you going to undergo surgery, or what was the story behind that? I remember you went that through a table the, in a match. That was the beginning of the end of my career. It was really, in Nashville, Tennessee. And at that point in time, they were still on NBC. And they had heard of me being able to go through uh, tables and so on and so forth. So they brought this table in, and I never even bothered to take a look at it. It had a five-inch wide steel band around it. Well, I went through the table all right, 
But as I pushed to get up from the table, the steel that had bent recoiled and hit me in the low abdomen. And about a month later, uh, we were in WrestleMania 4 in Trump Plaza. And when I got home from that, my intestines exploded, and I had seven abdominal surgeries after that. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. I was actually watching a, uh, a special that, a tape I had of a special that WWF did on uh, on, the, on the newcomers of the WWF in 1986, and Harley, you were referred to as an up and young comer. <laughs> I've been coming in wrestling in 1986. Yeah, 1986. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty when, funny because when, everybody talks about how Vince makes stars, but none of the people that they featured on that special ever made it. Really? Who were the other guys if in those like days? Dan Spivey, like Jimmy Jack Funk, like uh, Hercules Hernandez, all those like yeah. all those big uh, steroid guys. <laughs> but what did he say? I couldn't hear it. He said that um, he said that uh, there was a special that they were doing, and you know they always talk about Vince making superstars. And he was talking about like they had this thing in '86, and he was mentioning names: Hercules Hernandez, Billy, uh, Jimmy Jack Funk, and uh, Danny Spivey of of guys they brought in. They brought in that, that like you know basically those guys never made it to the top. Those those names that he mentioned in that that era. <laughs> and I was in that. Huh? Yeah, the the young new stars come into the WWF. <laughs> you know, how did you feel? You know, it's an interesting one. Is is um. When you came to the WWF, they pretty well erased your, you know, you, you had a history all over the world. And one of the things about the WWF in those days was that they erased your history when you came in. I mean, Dory Funk Jr., who was, you know, one of the biggest names ever in the industry, you know, was ha was Haas Funk, you know, like, I, like he was at a Bonanza. Yeah. And you were you were Harley Race and all the world titles, you know, it, were just erased from your r resume. Yeah, they, they could erase that by by not mentioning it. Uh, they couldn't erase it from people's minds. Uh, the only thing that I would or that I would not do uh, up there is, I should say, the only thing I would not do, the the stuff that uh, that they wanted me to do. I was Harley Race, and I was going to remain Harley Race. Uh, they had the King of the Ring thing, and that kind of fit Harley Race's image, so that's what I went with. Then they wanted me to do a lot of goofy. Uh, Stuff with the king stuff that I that I wouldn't do. So then they brought uh, Bobby Heenan in to do it for me. But Harley Race remained Harley Race all the way through his career. Did they ever ask you to change a name to like some? Oh yeah, like sure. Uh, did, any, did, they, did they ever come up with like a name, like a goofy name for you, or did, or did it never? Or did you say like, no, I'm Harley Race? That's you got it. That's what I said. And that's that's who I was. Uh, Real early in my career, I wrestled as uh, Jackie Long, and I came home from Nashville, Tennessee, and my dad said to me, he said, I haven't heard anything at all about Harley Race. Where where are you? What are you doing? And I said, well, Dad, I'm wrestling as Jackie Long in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I have a question for Harley. Yeah, hey, Harley. Go yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, you guys were talking about the most undeserving people to make it. Uh, you were like one of the first people to put over the Ultimate Warrior. I can remember. <laughs> you ever think that guy would ever uh, do something in the business? Uh, I didn't. Hear, I heard him say something about the Ultimate Warrior, but I couldn't hear it all. He just said that, like, when Warrior came in, you were one of the first top guys to put him over. And did you I ever was married. Think? I was married to him for six months. <laughs> Every, everywhere we went, it was the Ultimate Warrior and myself. Oh, Dave, I forgot to tell you. Oh, yeah, one of the other guys that were featured in that special was one of your favorites, uh, Ted Arcidi. Oh, Ted Arcidi. Oh, Ted Arcidi. Oh, oh, my God. You know, God, I got, a, situation in the business? I got involved in a hell of a group of guys there, didn't I? Ted Arcidi. You know, yeah, you know Ted Arcidi got Triple H in the business? Ted Arcidi was a guy who got Triple H? I didn't uh, know that. I was watching, like, one of the WWF home videos. Uh, it's called Triple H. It's our time. Uh -huh. And Triple H talked about his career, and he said Ted Arcidi was the guy who got him in the business. Wow. Ted R.C. Did you ever wrestle Ted R.C.? Uh, I can't remember if I did. I know who he was, of course, but I, I don't think I did. I guess with Warrior, I, when, when, you, when, when you worked with Warrior, uh, they must have obviously been trying to groom him and figured that, uh, eh, if this thing. <laughs> They, they give him to the master to do the grooming. <laughs> We're not going to take any chances. 
<laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember watching on Superstars like a tag match. It was Harley Race and somebody else against the Warrior and Don Morocco. I'm trying to think of who that was. Who? I I don't. It doesn't ring a bell to me. I don't know. Um, do you ever remember? Uh, you know, you know you. Don Morocco's an interesting name too. Um, yeah, Morocco's. Uh, when Donnie was first broke into business. They had him in, in Tampa, Florida, and they were grooming him to be the next Jack Briscoe. And Donnie, at that point in time, had uh, other interest. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow or another, that did, just didn't pan out the way they wanted it to. I remember but Don Donnie Marshall, when he was in the WWE. In my opinion, he's still really a great good. guy. But he bulked up to like a thousand pounds. Yeah, he got real big. Well, when he first came in, he was he was like uh, he looked like Jack Briscoe. Right. In fact, you you wrestled him. Didn't the Grand uh, Wizard manage him? No, this is way this is long before Grand Wizard days. No, this is this is um seventy four seventy five. I remember Harley going into Florida, uh, wrestling Jack Briscoe. Um, you know, I don't know, like 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 in some matches, and it was it was one of those things where, and it's interesting how the booking was in those days, is that. Uh, Morocco wrestled Harley Race, and I think Harley was an ex-champion. I think Briscoe, Jack Briscoe, would have been the world champion. And and the deal was that Morocco came close, and and had like almost beat Harley Race, but Harley Race actually would beat Don Morocco at the end. But the fact that you almost beat a guy, you know, actually elevated him to the level. And now you have guys beating the top guys, and they don't get elevated at all. But I remember like like Don Morocco was elevated to world title status by losing to Harley Race in, in Tampa and Miami or wherever those matches were held. Well, that's the that's the difference in having a, a business that is run. Uh, well, I think I'll just pass on that one. Okay. <laughs> slide. Anything else, Dave? Uh, yeah. One other, one last thing. I was wondering, what do you think of? Uh, I, I remember. I think Harley Race beat Terry Funk to win the title in, like, 1977. Yeah, Toronto, Toronto, I think. Yeah. I was wondering, what do you think of Terry Funk still wrestling and uh, taking all those bumps? Oh, I know. That is a good question. I mean, I don't know. Do you, would you, Harley, do you watch a lot of WCW or occasionally? Did I wrestle in WCW? No, 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 no. I'm just talking. Are you, are, do you watch WCW now? Yes. Yeah. What do you think of, of Terry Funk still wrestling and all those crazy things, you know, all those bumps he's, he's taking with all his injuries? Well, hopefully he still doesn't need the money. Uh, other than that, uh, his father died at 54 uh, in a, in type of in a kind of a shoot thing with uh, Mr. Wrestling of that ear, uh, not Johnny Walker, uh, the guy that hauls the ring around for the Atlanta. Isn't it like Gordon Nelson, right? Yes, Gordon Nelson. Uh, Gordon said, I can put you in this hole, you can't get out of it. Uh, they did it, and, and old man Funk had a heart attack fighting to get out of it. Uh, I don't know if, if Terry has got that in mind or not. I talked to him at, for about an hour the other night, and I asked him the similar question, what in the hell are you still doing? You know, Terry didn't start until, late, until a little bit later on. He was he's Oh, I'd say maybe 21, 22, just after he got out of college. Terry's only one year younger than myself, and Dory's two years older. Terry's 56 years old, and if he doesn't hang it up pretty soon, he's going to have to have knees, he's going to have to have God on knows what put into him keep him to keep him still upright. The thing with him that scares me is that um, it, it, it's like, you know, with, with Terry Funk, you know, there's some, some wrestlers um, have the ability, or, or whatever, I don't want to call it the ability, but so there are a lot of wrestlers who coast their way through matches. And Terry Funk is clearly not one of them. He takes as much punishment as, as anyone out there, and, and he's done it for you know, 35 years now. Well, and that's, he, that's part of being Terry Funk, is I can survive no matter what you what happens or what you try to do with me. We, we had not talked about... Okay, I, well, okay. I kind of had that thing uh, like that, or, or uh, I shouldn't say early on, but uh, pretty much through my career, I, you know, any goofy thing that was uh, out there to do, I'd be trying to do it. Uh, 
No, what? I don't know if you know about this, but uh, on uh, Tuesday, because it actually aired last night, he got kicked by a horse. They were doing a match in a stall, and I think the horse kicked him. Brian, um, right kicked shoulder. him in the shoulder, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and and I was just thinking, like, if that horse had kicked him in the head and not the shoulder, you know, I was like, what are they doing? I mean, it's like the horse is just sitting there, you know, they're in this stall, and there's a horse standing there, and all of a sudden, you know, him and Chris Candido are wrestling, and all of a sudden this horse just kicks. And it's just oh, like, wow. I, you know, it's like, oh, God. You know, this is, you know, I had heard, th I, thankfully I'd heard the story about it before, because if I hadn't and I'd seen that, I was just like, oh, no. I've seen him. Terry Funk do so many moonsaults to the floor and things like that where I just think as he turns and he's not quite getting it, that he's never, this time he's never getting up, but, but he always does. Yeah. Yeah, I know the feeling. Uh, I've watched him do it. Uh, there's there's nothing that I, uh, that Terry wouldn't try. I don't believe. Let's just hope he doesn't refer to Ahmed Johnson. <laughs> I don't want to think about he that. Did. Oh, he did. He all the Harlem Heat. Yeah, I have that? to wrestle uh, Ahmed Johnson. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, how many guys is that guy injured? Uh, quite quite a few. Although, that was pretty no, funny. Uh, Russo, like, on that wrestling line interview, he talks about how he doesn't deserve to be accused of this racism thing because he hired Ahmed Johnson. I'm just thinking, why would anybody take credit for hiring <laughs> Ahmed Johnson? <laughs> I don't know. I got a and, question, Charlie. Uh, Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, Brian. As far as the... Um, like 60 and 90 minute matches how did you prepare to do those was it like just you done matches every single night and you were ready as far as cardio or was it pacing or just a combo of both uh, a combo uh, mo most people of, of that era uh, were capable of going long long matches a short match back then was 15 20 minute match uh, it's just something that you set you set yourself a, a, a pace to do, and you try to keep people from varying it on you. Yeah. Did you have a Did you have a favorite city to wrestle in, like St. Louis or Tokyo, or or you know one of them where the fans you felt were the most respectful to your style? Well, you probably named uh, two of the top. Uh, the other one was. The others were pretty near any of the Florida towns. Mm -hmm. This is a question we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hit to some of the calls um, just a second. Uh, but I just, someone emailed me this and just wanted your opinion on some of these guys and then actually some interesting names here from the past. Um, just uh, wait, uh, let me just throw some names out at you um, that you're I'm sure familiar with every one of these men. Uh, Peter Maivia. Yes, sir. Graham, uh, I'll just throw out some names and just give me some comments. Uh, but Peter Maivia, we'll start with him. Peter Maivia, uh, I wrestled Peter in Alfia, Western Samoa. And they had, they're used to a round system over there. So they had thought they had scheduled it right. They put us in 10, 10 minute rounds. So what they'd done is they'd give us 100 minutes of wrestling. Oh my God. And along toward the end of it, it got so dark that the cops pulled their squad cars in. We were out outdoors in an, in an old soccer arena and turned their headlights on. And it just got so, so screwed up that they finally stopped it. But it, it went well, well over an hour. Wow. What about uh, Billy Graham? Billy Graham... Uh, Graham, for his knowledge that he had of wrestling, probably couldn't have been in a better place uh, than most of his career was up around the New York, uh, back then it was Northeast uh, NWA slash WWF. And they weren't into the big, long, uh, grueling matches, and Graham fit, fit in perfect right there. Uh, what about Larry Hennig? I mean, Larry Hennig was probably your first famous tag team partner. Yeah, Larry Hennig and myself were together four and a half years. And to this day, Larry was just down here uh, three or four months ago, if it's been that long ago, and never had an argument. 
And that's, you know, when you travel with a guy and you're with him for virtually four and a half years and you haven't argued with him, got to be something right with him. Now, here's a guy who was a top star at the same time you were a top name and you were in different promotions. And I don't even know, I mean, you probably did wrestle him at, at some point, but I'm not even sure your paths crossed. Nick, well, I guess I, actually, I shouldn't say that because I, I actually saw you guys wrestle in Japan. So, anyway, Nick Bockwinkle. Nick Bockwinkle. Nick was, uh, Nick's father was originally from St. Louis and at one point in time was involved in the promotion in St. Louis. Uh, Nick, for some reason or another, never was ever big around St. Louis, but he did hit it great in Minneapolis, and Nick's a, Nick's a real nice guy. Uh, cheap as cheap could possibly ever be, but uh, other than that, he's a nice guy. Uh, he was my tag team partner in Japan on a couple of occasions. Now, here's another one. Um, you know, a lot of the wrestlers that you talk to, when they talk about, like, the greatest performers, you know, when your name comes up, and the name that comes up a lot also from that era is Ray Stevens. Ray Stevens uh, was not only good in that, that era, he was good back for oh, six, seven, eight years before that. Ray, if there was ever anybody that I... Uh, kind of t uh, put myself in tone to as, as I was developing Harley Race. Ray Stevens was one of those people. Let's uh, let's go to some callers. Let's go to Charles in Los Angeles. Charles, you're next up with Harley Race. Sir, how you doing, Dave? Uh, Brian. Uh, Mr. Race, it's, it's really yes, nice to talk to you. Uh, I grew up back east during the early 70s. I saw you and Larry the Axe and Egg Boy on Championship Wrestling in Florida many times destroying the guy. I can't hear him. Okay, he was just saying that he saw you and Larry Hennig wrestle a lot in uh, Florida in the early 70s. Yeah, Larry came down to Florida uh, for me. I was booking Florida at that point in time. Uh, it was right after they had the plane plane went into Tampa Bay with Buddy Colt and uh, that group of guys that was there, and Bobby Shane was killed in it. I went in to, to book Florida at that time, and I brought Larry in uh, to Florida with me. Uh, I had two questions for you, actually. Um, you kind of answered one of them. What was your, your favorite program from around 1973 to 1980? Uh, and Well, two more. Um, and I saw great matches with you and Johnny Valentine. Do you think that, uh, if not for the plane accident, Johnny Valentine would have become NWA World Heavyweight Champion? And what was your favorite regional title outside of the National Wrestling Alliance World Heavyweight Championship? Maybe Missouri State, Florida, whatever. Did you, did you, did you, did you, did you I, I heard most of it. Uh, okay. John Valentine was in the early 70s up until his plane wreck. John Valentine was as good as they get. Uh, as far as him ever becoming world champion, I don't think that uh, they would have ever done that for the fact that John was... Uh, too unpredictable. Uh, <laughs> if he decided he didn't want to go someplace or didn't want to uh, show John, John was just John. Uh, his ability, as good as they get. A anything else, Charles? Uh, his favorite regional title? Yeah, do you have a favorite regional title as far as like... Uh, I'd have to yeah. say uh, the Missouri... The Missouri title as far as the regional I held it uh, eight different times also uh, th thank you very much Mr. Ray uh, great You're welcome. There. you gave me years of great entertainment uh, thanks for taking the call Dave okay hey Charles uh, call more often I miss you <laughs> okay let's go to uh, Tom in Los Angeles Tom what's going on hi Dave Hey, how are uh, hi, you? Harley. I don't know if you remember me, Harley, but I'm one of the two guys from Cedar Rapids, Waterloo, Iowa in the early 1970s. He used to badger you constantly to get us in the business. And he finally took us to Gus Karras, and he even got me a shot on St. Louis TV. And 30 years later, thank you for that. Uh, it's been a great influence to me. 
And speaking of 90-minute match, I remember in Waterloo, Iowa, he went 90 minutes with Dory Funk Jr., tremendous match. I've got friends that still think that was the greatest match they've ever seen. And even after the match, you guys fought another 20 minutes on the way back to the dressing room. You guys are just incredible. And you were oh absolutely the top performer of all time, I believe. Well, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, Tom Hankins. I was living in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and I used to badger you every time you come to Cedar Rapids or Waterloo, me and another guy. <laughs> I don't know if you remember or not. You'd show up to Easton where we'd be there waiting for you. And <laughs> you, you were a stalker. I was. And it finally worked. It really got me into the business really and got me on St. Louis TV. Got to work with Jack Bristol because of Harley, and I, I still thank him for it. That was, a, was that the highlight of your career, working with Jack Briscoe? It was. It was a, yeah, the greatest. I was just only been in the business a few months. You know, I was in the St. Louis dressing room with all these greats, and it was just uh, unbelievable. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know Harley mentioned like Jack Briscoe was one of his his favorite guys to wrestle too. Briscoe was, was, was a classic. Uh, a ninety minute draw. He was just uh, he was incredible. Our first suplex I've ever saw done anywhere was Harley Race came back from Japan had that suplex. I asked, "What is that? What is that?" I've never seen it before. He, where did, where, 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 where did, you know, Harley, where did that vertical suplex come from? Because because you were, I, I would think you were one of the guys who pop you popularized the move. I mean, the earliest suplexes I remember was was were you doing the gut wrenches and the big vertical the big vertical suplex where you held the guy up for a long time that like Bulldog does now. And I mean, everyone does the vertical suplex now, but I mean, uh, that that Harley Race trademark suplex. Well, there was there were several of those that uh, that I brought in into wrestling. The gut wrench was one of them. The double arm was the other one, and then the vertical. Uh, I had a guy up there once, and I just decided to see how long I could hold him, and that's how I got started. Well, that's all I really like to say. I just wanted to uh, again, thank Harley for everything he did for me and uh, for wrestling. Well, thank you. Yeah, the gut wrench would have come from, from amateur, right? Uh, yes. Because uh, they did that, but the version... It's just a, just a different version of the German. Yeah, the uh, the vertical suplex. I mean, did now did anyone? Uh, I'm trying to think. Did anyone do that type of suplex before you, or or did no. you like see? Okay. Uh, at, afterwards, uh, Dickie Murdoch come up with a version of the Brain Buster from that. He take you up with your head under his arm instead of you know you just bring you up about middle ways and drop back with you. But the majority of, of the suplexes I originated. Um, what were your What were your feelings as far as um, you know in the last two years with the deaths of uh, both Baba and uh, Saruta? You know, considering that you know you made you know a great living many years going through that company. Well, when they lost both of them, they lost two great people. Uh, to me, Baba was just a, a prince of a person. He, I went over to Japan the first time in the late 60s, and I met Baba then. Baba's been to the States numerous times and has stayed at my home. Uh, he's just, it's just hard to describe the type of person he was. He had nothing bad to say about anybody. And if, if he could find good to say, he would. Taruto, I talked of him earlier. Uh, again, another, just another great guy. Were you, were you familiar as far as um, these guys would have been, the guys that are there now, uh, Misawa and Kawada, would have been starting their career right when you were, like, Winding up your Japanese days. I mean, do you have remembrance of Misawa was the original Tiger, the, the second Tiger Mask, but the one that was there when you were there. And uh, Toshiaki Kawada was, uh, I mean, I remember he was like a first, second match guy who later became, you know, one of the top guys in the business. A, a lot of those kids over there and still are of doing that because they're taught from the ground up. They're not just taught how to, uh, to land. Uh, how to create mayhem. They're taught the basics of wrestling, and they're, it's drummed into them. I mean, they, when you go through one of those dojos over there, you know you've been somewhere. 
that's what I'm trying to do with my school and the stuff that I've got running here in the central part of Missouri. Why don't you tell everyone about like uh, the promotion you're doing in the school you're running right now? Well, I have WLW, which is World League Wrestling, and then Harley Race Academy, which is headquartered in Eldon, Missouri. Uh, you can pull up HarleyRace.com and just kind of follow your way through it. And you, you can see where we've been, what we've been doing, and uh, the event that we got coming up. Uh, the, I do a lot of fundraising stuff with uh, booster clubs, uh, MDA, uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I just... Uh, you know, got tired of doing nothing, decided I'd get back into the wrestling business and run a show that uh, you can bring everybody to. You can bring your mother, your uh, grandmother, your wife, your daughter, and you're not going to be really embarrassed being there. Don't, don't you think, you know, there's, there's you know, I, a lot of the stuff that's going on, and it's one of the, re, you know, the, the new attitude of wrestling is certainly one of the reasons you can't knock the fact that the crowds, for WWF at least right now, are, are huge, so they must have a good formula. At the same time, isn't there something, I mean, to me sometimes it's like, you know, there are people who are friends of mine that I can't bring to those shows. And I guess maybe it was always that case in wrestling, but, but because of what they would see, they would like, you know, go, why did you bring us here? <laughs> They're doing this and this and this, you know? And it's kind of like, you know, sometimes I want to bring friends to shows, and you got to think of, like, which friends can I bring to the shows that won't be morally offended by what's going to happen at the show. And I think that's, that's something that's sort of, I don't know, kind of it's one of those weird things about wrestling right now, unfortunately. Well, that's, that's what I was saying uh, a little bit earlier. And, and what I'm still saying now, uh, anybody out there uh, with a computer can pull up HarleyRace.com and, and just kind of go through their, their site. And you'll see letters of recommendation in there from the military academies to uh, pretty near every place. I, I shouldn't say pretty near every place that we have been, we've been invited back. Uh, I... I one of the people that believe that the W should still be involved in wrestling, and that's what we're trying to give them, is what I more or less grew up with and what you probably did. Uh, and I'm like you. You know, if, if I have to think about who I'm going to be able to invite to it, I, I don't want to do that. I, I know I can have anyone come to see this that wants to see it, they're going to leave highly entertained and not embarrassed. Harley, we are totally out of time. I want to thank you very much for doing the show. And I want to remind everyone that uh, tomorrow we will have Mike Mooneyham of the Charleston Post Courier with myself and Brian. And we'll see you at...